Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Butterfield. Welcome to the Library of Congress and to the John W. Kluge Center. Today we're honored to host our annual Kislak Lecture, delivered by the J.I. Kislak Chair for the Study of the History and Cultures of the Early Americas, Marcy Norton. We are tremendously thankful to the Kislak Family Foundation for its generous support for the Kislak Chair here at the Kluge Center. The Kislak Chair program was established in 2018. Since then, it has attracted some of the most renowned scholars working on the early Americas. Kislak chairs are also able to work with the J.I. Kislak collection at the library, which is composed of important archaeological artifacts, rare books, manuscripts, maps. J. Kislak donated this collection to the Library of Congress in 2014, ensuring its preservation for the American people and enabling hugely important research of the sort you'll hear about today. Marcy Norton, in addition to being the sixth Kitzlack Chair in Residence at the Kluge Center, is a historian at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the author of the prize-winning book, Sacred Gifts, Profane Pleasures, A History of Tobacco and Chocolate in the Atlantic World, as well as her latest book, the topic of today's lecture, The Tame and the Wild, People and Animals After 1492. Now, we will be taking questions from the audience at the end of this lecture, so think about anything you'd like to ask. If you're here in person, raise your hand. Please wait for a microphone. If you're watching us and joining online, uh, please put your question in the Q&A field, and we'll be taking those questions as well. Now, please join me in welcoming Marcy Norton. Thank you, Kevin, for that kind introduction. So I want to begin um, by expressing my gratitude to the many communities, institutions, and individuals who've made it possible for me to be here today and to write this book. I want to first gratefully acknowledge that we gather here on the unceded ancestral lands of the Anacostan, Piscataway, and Pamunkey peoples. I want to express my gratitude as well to diverse Native communities, past and present, whose knowledge is the foundation of much of the research I am presenting today. I want to thank the Kislak Foundation and the Kluge Center, whose support has made this year at the library possible, and also to say I've received support from both of these um, organizations in different ways over the years, and I'm so grateful to the amazing people and collections at the library. I did much of the research for this book here over the last 15 years. And I also want to uh, express my appreciation for all of the scholars who has made my own work possible here in the US and in Mexico and Brazil and many other places and colleagues who have shared ideas with me and to everyone in this room, um, especially my parents who traveled all the way from the West Coast and um, friends and colleagues on Zoom. So let us begin today in um, Choapam in Oaxaca, Mexico, about 150 years after the Spanish had begun colonization. And as you can see, this is a town that's in the northeastern part of the region um, in the foothills going towards the, the plains. And um, we're going to start with a priest named Alonso, Alfonso de Espinosa who was preaching in a community near this town. And he was, he was fulminating against um, traditional ways of worshiping, against um, those who were, in his view, serving the devil, adoring idols and animals. And after his service, he was approached by a man who was described as Ladino, meaning that he was indigenous, but very acculturated to Spanish ways in terms of language and habits. And this man denounced his father-in-law. He told Espinosa that his the Zapotec elder had left the village and his family to go live by himself in the forest, that he had retreated from interaction with others into thickets and solitude in wilderness. Except for that this elder didn't actually live by himself. Rather, he shared his life with a macaw. According to the missionary, the man had made a life that was so singular that it was not imitatable, because he, what he loved most was a macaw. In order to keep the animal content, the elder worked sowing, harvesting, and looking for fruits to feed it. The son-in-law claimed that his father-in-law adored the bird like a god, 
and that he made frequent offerings of his own blood and copal resin in intolerable ceremonies that he exercised without tiring. The son-in-law and Espinosa hatched a plot. They would trick the rest of the family into thinking that they were going on a festive hunting expedition to the thickets of that wilderness where there was an abundance of deer and other wild animals. And Espinosa himself was descended from a family of hunters, and so he appealed to the family that they would go on this expedition. And I add this detail because other than the son-in-law, it appears the rest of the family was entirely okay with this way of living. And so um, they went off and were going through the forest for several hours, and then um, as they had planned, they went they, they led the group to a little hut of straw in the middle of that solitude. There they encountered, in the words of the missionary, the old idolater on his knees with his arms crossed and his head bowed like a penitent before a little altar of wood and flowers. According to Espinosa, the Macaw stood there, quote, receiving the worship and adoration of the sacrilege and scandalous ministry. When the, cler when the Macaw saw the cleric stout before him, he was so upset that he cried out, and his, his voice resounded throughout the rough lands as if high winds raged. The, the style of this missionary is quite Baroque. The Espinosa, upset by the clamor and riot, then grabbed the bird, and he killed it. The priest then turned his attentions to the rest of the entourage, no doubt shocked at this act of violence towards the beloved bird and pronounced, look now, my children, what a dastardly trickster is the devil, that a rational man to whom God gave all other animals to serve him has been subjected to serve at the bird's feet as if he were the master. This tragic episode illustrates one of the most important ways that European and indigenous cultures had developed over millennia. We see here vastly different attitudes towards animal subjectivity and inner subjectivity. Subjectivity describes an animal's, including human animals, capacity for reason, emotion, communication, and other abilities we associate with personhood. Inner subjectivity, the way I use the word, is the ability of one animal to recognize and relate to the subjectivity of another. By putting his relationship with the macaw at the center of his life, the Zapotec elder had made interspecies intersubjectivity a practice of reverential care that accompanied his devotion to traditional deities. For reasons I will explain, I don't think he was actually worshiping the macaw. In contrast, the European missionary found both the macaw's subjectivity and the interspecies intersubjectivity shared by the elder and the bird deeply problematic, even a form of devil worship. In my talk today, drawn from my new book, I want to explore the cultural reasons that these men diverged so greatly in their attitude toward this macaw and the interspecies relationships. What lay behind the Zapotec man's decision to devote himself to this bird? And what lay behind the missionary's hostility to that relationship? The question of animal subjectivity has been mostly the domain of scientists, including the wonderful primatologist Brands de Waal, who recently died and of philosophers such as Peter Singer who draw from Western philosophical traditions. But I think the question of subjectivity and inner subjectivity is also an important question for historians. It's only through humanities kinds of research that we can answer the question, what are the cultural factors that allow people to recognize the subjectivity of other animals, and how do they value or not inner subjective relationships between species? So let us begin with the deep context that helps us to understand the Zapotec elder's dedication to caring for and being cared for by a macaw in his later years. This deep context is familiarization. Simply put, familiarization is the practice of taming individual wild animals in order to make them into companions, similar but different to the, to the pets that we love and who live in our households. And so a few broad things about familiarization. Candidates eligible for eating are also eligible for taming, which means that there's not selected species that you would just familiarize and then not eat. It can be the same species. But once tamed, an individual will almost never be killed. 
These are animals who are not bred in captivity, their reproduction is not controlled, and the autonomy of the individual animal is emphasized. And the primary purpose is companionship and pleasure. In my book, I look at this phenomena in a large swath of the Americas, in South America, and what I um, term, and as do other scholars, Greater Amazonia, that includes the Caribbean and also um, areas that today are part of Brazil, Ecuador, Colombia, and Peru. And so this is a map that just shows some of the places where I, I explore familiarization. And I'm going to just get, show you a few slides that come from this region to introduce this topic. So the, this first slide um, was in a manuscript from the late 16th century. We don't know exactly where, but somewhere in coastal South America, maybe Panama. And I think it really articulates clearly what I was saying before about the um, sort of parallelism and the intermingling between hunting and familiarization, that one, that the same bird could potentially be brought home um, as food or for its feathers and or become um, a, a familiarized, a tamed animal. Here's from the same manuscript and some images of these birds being caught. Um, the image on the left is from what is today Trinidad. Um, these birds are being caught with a tame decoy bird on the right um, with cotton pads that would sort of knock them out. And here, just some of the many kinds of images that I found. Here we see in the, this detail a macaw and a monkey just hanging out in the rafters. And so it would be normal for these tamed animals to live at home, but something that's emphasized by a lot of the sources is how much freedom that they were given, that sometimes they would return to the forest and then fly back on, on their own volition. And here we have a 19th century image from the Western Amazon in what is today Colombia, and a woman um, pictured here with her macaw and some parrots and another kind of, and a, and a monkey as well on her shoulder. And the work of taming animals was, was often the work of women, and it was seen as sort of in parallel with, with nurturing children as well. And so I said the primary purpose of, of taming these animals was for pleasure and companionship, but sometimes they were also traded as well. And this was something that Europeans were really eager to be on the receiving end. So I started with an anecdote where this kind of relationship was seen as, as very suspect, but there were other reactions as well. And, and we see that very early on, Europeans were bringing back these tamed animals to Europe, including Columbus himself, who on, the, on his landing in 1492 traded some goods to get parrots. And here, this is from um, what is today Brazil. And uh, this tradition continued, uh, continues up to the, um, you know, into recent times here, we have the anthropologist Levi Strauss with a spider monkey named probably Lucinda. And a recent article in the Washington Post, which was not at all about this phenomenon, it was actually about the survival of um, indigenous languages, and, but it happened to picture this woman with her parrot. And I also included this picture not only to show its continuity into the present, but in fact, my early modern sources are very similar in some ways to this article, in that the, the clues to these practices appear in documents and images that are not about the phenomena, but are sort of on the margins, just as, as this woman and her parrot. There's no mention of why she has the parrot in the article. So now I want to return to the zone of, of um, where I started the anecdote, which is Mesoamerica, a term that scholars use to describe um, it, what is today much of Mexico and Guatemala and parts of Central America. And it's a, a cultural region that share, even though there's an enormous amount of political and linguistic diversity before the Spanish arrive, some shared common cultural practices, in, including familiarization, but also, for instance, drinking chocolate um, and using certain kinds of calendars that I'll be talking about later on. The area, the shaded area represents the areas that was um, controlled by the Aztec Empire at the time that the Spanish arrived. Um, and so, as in Amazonia, there's some, some important similarities, but also differences. One of the similarities is that familiarization was entangled with hunting practices. And an important difference is that here was, is an area where there was also um, domestication of animals, turkeys and dogs. So when I started this research, one of the very first sources for Mesoamerica where I saw familiarization discussed 
was the Florentine Codex, which is a 12-book um, work that was co-created by indigenous scholars in the 16th century and a Spanish, Spanish missionary. Um, you can see here on this page that it's in Nahuatl and Spanish and also um, uh, illustrated. The Nahuatl was first um, created first by a group of, as I said, um, indigenous scholars who were fluent in Spanish and Latin and Nahuatl. And this is from book 11, which concerns animals and plants. And taming practices appear in several places. Uh, they talk about taming macaws and parrots and various kinds of finches. But the entry that where familiarization was talked at most length concerned a monkey. And so there is a description that went along with that image here, where they described how these monkeys would be caught with um, hunters putting out a certain kind of stone that would then make a popping noise and it would scare the mothers away and then they would grab the baby monkeys and bring them home. And then there was further description of, of um, how the, the tamed monkeys would be raised and they would describe how, uh, how the monkey would speak by whistling, that it would beg from young women in the household, extending the hand, offering their hand and their presence. In other words, it would really emphasize the kind of subjectivity of the monkey. So in the Nahuatl of the Florentine Codex and also in contemporary dictionaries from the period, there were words for this. And I really want to emphasize this because the fact that, the, and this is true in greater Amazonia as well, that there's a whole vocabulary around these practices indicates the conceptual importance within indigenous culture. So you can see this is a, a, a number of different um, uh, words around taming. Um, including to tame animals, to tame another, um, to tame something this way, taming in this manner, the one who tames the wild. The, the root word in all of these um, expressions is slakasiwi, which means um, to become tame. And Antonio Rincon, uh, a Jesuit who wrote about the Nahuatl language in 1595, explained that this means to become human or to become tame. And I think this is a, a really important clue about, again, taming is seen as a way of, of turning another into a subject. And so to become human in this context doesn't mean human like homo sapien, but to become a subject through the practice of taming. And you find this in other indigenous uh, uh, dictionaries as well. This is from the Zapotec, such as uh, the elder um, whom I began this talk with, and a whole variety of, of words around taming in, in Zapotec as well. So another place where you see familiarization is in the famed zoo that was in the Mexica, the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. This is a map that was reproduced in the a letter that Cortez sent back to Charles V and was later published and hand-colored from 1524. And, and here, focusing in on the compound, you can see at just the bottom left, there's a grid there that shows different animals. And that is a depiction of this really famous zoo. So all of the uh, Spanish soldiers and conquistadores who arrived into the city and were able to see it were just awestruck. Cortez wrote about certain large rooms, low, filled with large cages, with mountain lions and jaguars, wolves, foxes, and different kinds of cats, many of each, um, as well as birds of prey and all kinds of different waters, including tanks of water where there were aquatic birds as well. He noted the care taken to feeding the animals. Upwards of 500 people were employed to look after them. And in order to make this possible, there was tribute required from um, local communities to give these animals or they would be purchased in other ways. So here we see a copy of a tribute list that local, a local community from the north who was required to deliver a live eagle every year. Um, and the animals in the, in the zoo, it, not exactly like the familiarized animals elsewhere because some of these were in fact ritually killed. These are the remains of a wolf who was dressed like a warrior before he was killed and treated much like the way that enemy warriors might have been killed as well um, in, in these cer ceremonial rites. So in doing excav 
excavations, archaeologists have found them with um, these kinds of uh, decorative elements that, that show their being um, uh, treated the way that warriors would be treated. And it wasn't just Tenochtitlan. Other communities in Mesoamerica had similar kinds of, of compounds of animals. So this is from a Mixtec manuscript that was created prior to Spanish colonization, showing offerings of a baby jaguar and a baby eagle in um, the Mixteca Alta region of Oaxaca. So I'm going to give a few examples now from a work that I spent a lot of time at the Library of Congress looking at, actually two works, that are based on the um, expeditions of a Spanish physician named Francisco Hernández, who was appointed by Philip II in 1569 to go to the Americas to collect information about medically useful plants and to in interview indigenous healers for that purpose. And he decided on his own, wasn't part of the original plan, that he was going to work on animals as well. And I'm quite sure actually he got a fair amount of assistance from some of those Nahua scholars who I talked about before who wrote the Florentine Codex. His works were not published in his lifetime, but there were two book length works, or two works that had a, quite a bit of his, his material in them. One of them, and that's the one on the left, is the Library of Congress copy, um, a 1634 work by the Spanish Jesuit um, Juan Eusebio Nuremberg. And then on the right was published in Rome in 1648 by the Lynchay Academy, which also sponsored Galileo. Um, and I'm specifically kind of uh, linking this to some scientific names that you might be familiar with. And so uh, Hernandez, um, with the help of an enormous indigenous entourage, as you can see, spent three years traveling throughout New Spain, as Mexico was known to the colonizers. And, um, and he also um, had with him three, at least three artists, indigenous artists, who he asked to draw animals in a kind of specimen model from looking at European model books. So all these, these animals, here we have some mammals and, um, and some birds and some reptiles were painted, originally paintings that went back to Spain and were in the Escorial Palace of Philip II because they were so beautiful. All of those paintings were destroyed in a fire in 1671. So all that we have left of them are these engravings that were based on that. And I'm spending a little bit of time on these um, illustrations because a disproportionate number of them are actually of tamed animals. And I think it has to do with the fact that they were able, of course, to get close to these wild animals. Oh, here we have the scorial. So among the animals that were familiarized that are mentioned by Hernandez include a porcupine and a possum, armadillo, squirrels, Hernandez was particularly captivated by tamed raccoons, or mapach and nawat, describing them being tamed and fed at home, showing affection to all members of the household. When I started this research, um, I wasn't on Instagram, but now that I'm on Instagram, you can see lots of cute tamed raccoons um, <laughs> who would follow household members with great affection, throwing themselves on their people and rolling around happily on the floor. They play and frolic in a thousand ways. Likewise, the peccary, an animal whose tame ability was also appreciated by indigenous groups throughout greater Amazonia. The Spanish compared them to a pig. They're often known in, as pigs, but they're actually more closely related to hippopotamus. Um, is easily tamed. It is voracious and eats all the food that is offered. It is a peaceful animal who plays in a thousand ways, though he attacks strangers. He also, um, he was particularly uh, fond of the great Curacao, or in Nahuatl, the Tepetot, whose main attraction seemed to be uh, the affectionate nature. He described the bird's habit of asking for food from those of the house by pulling it on clothing, knocking on closed doors with its beak when it wants to enter into some place, and follows his master when he is loose. And when the master arrives home, the bird greets him with happy celebration. Um, and this, actually, Hernandez's work 
um, have a really large impact in Europe, and this is a, from the 19th century um, naturalist Cuvier, who actually, you know, sort of follows up on the, the tameability of, of, the, uh, of the great Curacao. And le reptiles were represented as well. Um, he wrote, I hear from those who feed and raise the snake in their homes, referring to the rattlesnake. There are many who have tamed them um, and have them for pleasure, first removing the venom from their fangs. He also wrote of a certain green snake um, who are brought from the wilderness, he explained, when they are the size of a finger and grow until the thickness of a leg, um, and were then maintained in a large ceramic vessel padded with straw where they rest and live for most of the time until the meal hour when they leave their nests and climb amicably onto the shoulders of their master, who tolerates with benevolence the embrace of such a horrendous animal, or who curled up in the middle of the patio in the manner of a big wheel, eats peacefully what they are fed and then rests. Another popular candidate for taming was the mountain horned lizard who likes to be picked up and carried in the hand and touched, staying so immobile and tranquil calm. For this reason, wrote Hernandez, indigenous people refer to them as friend of man. And of course there are, um, well, as I said already, a lot of, of birds as well. So um, another source uh, and so, as I mentioned before, uh, usually these tamed animals only make cameos. So there's quite a literal cameo in the missionary source by um, a missionary who was nicknamed Motolonia, or the humble one in, in Nahuatl. And he described how um, he was sort of describing with great appreciation the conversion to Christianity of indigenous people in, in Tlaxcala, the Nahuas there. And he described how on Easter and the Christian holiday of Corpus Christi, there would be dramatic reenactments of, of, of Christian of, uh, events, um, including, uh, well, or pre-Christian in this case, the, um, uh, the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise. And so he described how there was a large tree that was set up for the occasion full of parrots and that Eve liked to play with a tamed, the, the actress playing Eve, Eve with a tamed ocelot. So here's a cute little ocelot. Um, and that and in another occasion, there was a reenactment of St. Francis of Assisi talking to the animals. And in this case, he was lecturing um, a coyote and telling the coyote to please not attack the livestock. Um, and here's a, a, a image of, a, of what I think is a tame coyote um, from one of these manuscripts as well. So I want to um, return to the, the source that I started with, um, with in today's talk, uh, from take us back again to Oaxaca. And uh, the source for this was a missionary named Francisco de Burgoa, who was talking about his colleague Espinosa. And he um, elsewhere described a set of practices that I think shed even more light on what was going on. And the context for this, as you'll see, has to do with practices around the birth of a, of a newborn. And this is from, actually, the images here are from the Florentine Codex. And what they show is a kind of spiritual guide meeting with the parents of a newborn and um, telling them about the importance on the day of which, which the child was born. And these, and everyone that would have a name that would actually be their calendar day. And this is, would not be the 365-day calendar, but a 260-day ritual calendar that was made up, each day would have a name that was composed of the numbers 1 through 13 and 20 different symbols, um, including the ones pictured here, which are eagle, rabbit, and snake. Um, and that would have implications for sort of the, the, the experiences that child would have later on in life. So with this in mind, um, Burgoa talked about a conversation that he had with a young indigenous boy. The boy confessed, and this is Burgoa writing, that he had an animal, and further explained that since I was very little, I saw this animal very close to me, and I was used to eating what he ate and to feel in myself whatever injuries that he received. 
Traditionally, this passage has been interpreted to refer to a belief that people would actually turn into animals and that these animal doubles were known as a nawal. But I want to offer a different interpretation by looking closely at what Burgoa actually wrote after questioning the boy about what he called this belief. At birth, parents brought their infant to a spiritual guide, who Burgoa characterized as a sacrilegious priest or a minister of Satan. This person, an expert in the sacred calendar, knowing from memory all of the names of all of the days of the year which come from animals or plants according to their count, would name the child according to the day sign. The calendar expert then pierced the vein on the ear or beneath the tongue with the bone flint of the baby um, with a fingernail and offered the blood to the devil, or rather a traditional deity, and then indicated that the wild beast, what wild animal, a beast or a bird, is going to accompany the child as a guardian angel. When the child reached the age of free will, Burgoa wrote, she was, or he was instructed in traditional teachings. The guide taught that, the God, that God gave life, indicated the day in which the child was born, and found the child a friend and guardian in that animal. The guide and the youth then went together to make an unspecified sacrifice, perhaps another bloodletting. And then in the words of Burgoa, the devil um, brought them an animal of this kind, one so tame and subservient that although it was a lion or a snake, meaning a mountain lion, it shows itself to be docile. And the youth was compelled to caress it and talk to it as if it was a familiar. Burgo described this practice as taking up company with a brute. The missionary further explained that the devil made it so that these children who were blind to true faith would experience any blow or injury that the animal angrily, that the animal friend um, uh, would receive. And he insisted that such cases were innumerable. Burgo's account is shaped by his understanding of demonic agency and colonial ideas about Nawals, influenced by European ideas about animal familiars. He viewed the indigenous guide as a satanic priest and considered the boy's action as the making of a demonic pact. Clearly, Burgoa also assumed that an extraordinarily tame animal evidenced diabolical interference and that only the devil could make it possible for a human to experience the felt pain felt by an animal friend. But there is a different interpretation possible, particularly if we pay close attention to the boy's words and look beyond Burgoa's diabolical discourse. Then another story comes to light. We see parents who are told that their child will have a companion animal. They talk to their young one about this animal. Others in their community learn of this connection. The family and their friends look for an animal on their walks in the forest, on their hunting expeditions, on their journeys. They teach their child the animal's nesting habits, how to listen for movements and vocalizations, skills that were used in hunting as well, and how to identify tracks. Then one day a young animal is brought home. Despite his fixation on the diabolical, Burgoa's account allows us to see that this relationship was compre comprehended as mutual and reciprocal. And in this, I want to uh, offer um, a new interpretation of these images that have been traditionally interpreted as showing perhaps an animal double of these are Mishtek people. And you can see they are identified by their calendar days, uh, birth dates here, um, the skull, the jaguar, a reed. And then they're also next to these, um, these animals, a mountain lion, a raccoon, um, a baby a baby mountain lion. So um, I'm, I want to just mention briefly that I think one of the reasons that familiarization has not been really told in colonial histories is because of the environmental history that's often referred to as the Columbian Exchange and one that was really popularized by Jared Diamond as well and that has tended to um, bring to it a kind of evolutionary view of society, one that assumes that animal domestication is a necessary stepping stone for the advancement of civilization. And you can see this in this quote from Crosby's book. And so that meant that familiarization has either been ignored 
or it's been seen as kind of uh, an on-the-way step going towards full domestication. And these were attitudes that modern scholars have actually inherited from missionaries from the period themselves who would actually justify colonization in part because of the bringing of domesticated animals. And so I want to, by way of conclusion, I'm, I thought I would have more time than I do, so I'm going to just sort of briefly touch on some of these ideas, talk about the sort of other half of the story, which is how are we going to understand, again, why Europeans um, such as Bergoa either weren't able to see familiarization as a practice unto itself or found it to be so suspicious. And this has everything to do with their own modes of interaction. Familiarization and hunting was a, an indigenous forms of interaction. They had their own. And what were these? Well, one of them was also hunting. And um, in my book, I talk a lot about both similarities and really important differences in hunting. But the thing that I'm going to emphasize right here is this is a domain within European culture where there was the opportunity to see other animals as hunts, both prey animals, but above all, what I call vassal animals, the, the horses and the dogs and raptors who were viewed as collaborators. So, so there was a way in which Europeans were actually were very invested in seeing the subjectivity of certain kinds of animals. And that tradition is very much with us today. Um, we, you know, in the West, take for granted that certain kinds of animals we would never want to kill or eat, you know, dogs or horses. And that's very much a legacy of these European attitudes of which animals are, uh, are subjects and which kinds of interspecies inner subjectivity is to be celebrated. But of course, and, you know, and, and the prey aspect, why we might really appreciate Flacco, the owl, you know, I think is also a, a legacy of this. Rest in peace. So um, on the other hand, there's livestock husbandry. And here... Um, the tradition, which is very much with us today, uh, 92 billion animals killed a year globally who are uh, categorized as livestock, has seen these as not subjects, but as objects. This is from an English husbandry manual that sort of um, expresses that view. And one of the things that I look at in my book is the way that, uh, is that there are technologies behind objectification. And one example of a technology is actually the separation of the slaughterhouse from a butcher. And today, of course, that's even more exaggerated, right, where we you know, never see the animals that are killed until it's in a grocery and cellophane. And you, but this kind of separation was already happening in the late 15th century. You see in the late 15th century people complaining about hearing animals being butchered or having to walk through streets where there's blood in it. And you see slaughterhouses moved to the, to the edges of, of communities and cities. And so this process of objectification has its own history that I explore in, in some detail. You know, this is the legacy. And, then it, and these, this mode of interaction is brought to the Americas and really important part of colonization. Here's a, a textile mill, so other, other aspects of, of this mode of interaction as well. So the, the last thing I'm going to say um, in today's talk is to say that animal agriculture, however, is not successful in completely erasing animal subjectivity. And so it pops up now and again when there's like a, a runaway cow here who doesn't want to go to the slaughterhouse. And another way that it pops up is, I argue, in demonological discourse. So I think one of the ways that Europeans deal with this sort of like incredible contradiction of knowing that certain animals are, and really that in some way all animals are subjects, is by putting themselves in the position of those animals. And so I suggest that representations of hell actually show people in the position of the animals who are going to slaughter. And this is one of the ways that um, this subjectivity is, is recognized. Another way it's recognized is by viewing the subjectivity of animals who do not, who are not dogs or horses, as suspect. And thinking that, for instance, the relationship that a woman has with a cat, which in this period is not a sort of, uh, you know, legitimate um, kind of subject relationship, might be a witch or to see that an animal who shows too much subjectivity 
might in fact not even be an animal, but be a person who's, who is taking the shape of an animal. And so I think that in fact is um, the way that idea, European ideas of animal subjectivity are showing up in the account that I showed, that I talked about in the beginning with Burgoa. So we might want to, um, if we want to keep a sort of a place for Colombian exchange, I don't think it's that helpful anymore to think about the exchange of biota as if it's plants and animals um, moving without agency, but rather the systems into which they're brought and incorporated. And so the real exchange might be what goes west is the mode of interaction of livestock husbandry and diabolical discourse, and what goes east is familiarization and the empirical kinds of observation that goes with it, these kinds of um, scientific, we could say early modern scientific discoveries that are become really inspirational actually to subsequent naturalists. Um, and then the animals themselves that start showing up in Europe in the 16th century and beyond. And in fact, I argue in the book, help give rise to sort of modern ideas that we identify with, with pets, a sort of expansion of, of the place for interspecies, intersubjectivity. Um, and just the last thing I want to, I want to close by reminding us is, is to return again to Oaxaca and thinking about um, the fact that something like 5% of the population today is indigenous but 80% of lands that are where there's the most biodiversity are owned um, or controlled by indigenous peoples. And so the importance of supporting those efforts um, and the connection between recognizing subjectivity of the animals who are closest to us, but also expanding those concepts of subjectivity to a much wider realm. Um, and this is a, a protest by a, a group that is headed by um, indigenous people in Oaxaca fighting against mining in that, in that region. So um, I'll end there and happy to take questions. Marcy, thank you so much for that talk. It was amazing to see the range of sources that you were bringing to bear. And, and I was curious to, to, to hear a little bit more, if you wouldn't mind, um, talking about your, your, your methodology. Uh, you mentioned that, that a lot of times you're, you're finding these, these um, you know, evidentiary stories about these kinds of familiar events uh, on the edges of larger texts and, and diving into dictionaries and things like that. And, and I wondered, you mentioned, I think at some point at the outset that you know, this is a project 15 years in the making. And so I wondered, I wondered if you would talk a little bit more about like, what was the aha moment that you were onto something, like were you just sort of taking copious notes and then sort of going back to things? You know, how many times did you circle back around to certain sources looking for some of these stories? Um, and, and was there one moment where you were like, oh, I have, I have something here? Yeah, th thank you for that question. Um, well, I think it, it did, you know, I started with the sources that I knew. I mean, in some ways, the, the story I was, I, the, the first um, story that was kind of the primordial aha moment was actually, I was reading um, an account that is very well known to historians, Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo, about the colonization of the Circum Caribbean, and he had a story, he, he told about this um, episode where an indigenous man had escaped um, slavery or some other kind of coercion and was living with three pigs who were, you know, these are European introduced species, and he had tamed them to act like hunting dogs to chase down other pigs. And um, when I read that, I thought, what is going on here? You know, like, if, if I can explain this, I, like, I feel like I'll explain a lot of other things. 
And then I just kept my eye out, and, and it was just Oviedo himself, you know, he, there's like a tame fox and a coati, and, you know, lots of parrots and monkeys are appearing. And actually the same thing with the Florentine Codex, which again, you know, very, like one of the most well-known sources there is, I, the taming just kind of popped up. And, it, and at that point then, so maybe the secondary stage of the aha moment was then going to dictionaries and finding that there was a whole vocabulary around it. Because up until that point, it seemed like, well, am I imposing this, you know, sort of from the outside? Or is this something that, that mattered to people themselves? And, and finding that there was a vocabulary around it um, in, in lots of regions, in lots of indigenous languages, um, was also, you know, really key. And I mean, one more thing I'll say too, and part of the reason it's such a joy to give a talk is I can show so many more images than I have, than I was, in, I was very restricted in my book. Um, I shouldn't, I want you to go get the book anyway, so I shouldn't, <laughs> but so, so, so often, and you know, the imagery in visual sources would take the form, would not even be discussed in the text itself. You know, and it would just sort of appear, which I think is revealing on multiple levels. Like one, it's revealing on the ubiquity of it, the pervasiveness, and then also Europeans' lack of vocabulary for it themselves, part of their own blindness. You know, so. Sure. Hi, Marcy. This is great, and I look forward to reading the book. Um, question about the, the the distinction between familiarization and domestication. As, as you know better than anybody, the standard literature argues that, you know, Diamond and others, that, well, there were all these animals that could be domesticated in, in Eurasia, but there weren't any in the Americas. And I'm, I'm just wondering, if is that true, or, or is this sort of a cultural choice that's made in, for, in, in the Americas that, that creates this distinction? Yeah, thank you, Dane. Um, the... I mean, yeah, that is what I'm arguing, that it's a cultural choice and that people, like, that basically Jared Diamond and Alfred Crosby, in some sense, were asking the wrong question, that, in, that they go into it assuming that self, it's self-evident that if you could domesticate, you would domesticate. And I'm suggesting that's not true. You know, that, and in fact, and some of the best evidence for this is in regions where indigenous communities are able to remain autonomous from colonialism for a long time, they absolutely reject livestock husbandry. They accept European domesticates very enthusiastically. And one of my arguments is, in fact, the way that dogs and horses in particularly are um, brought into indigenous communities in places where they, which is horses everywhere, and in dogs in many places, is because of familiarization. And, and that makes sense, because those are the animals that Europeans were treating like subjects. But they'll do that with chickens, too. I have a lot of, I look a lot at chickens in the Amazonia point where, and the Europe, because Europeans are just shocked. You know, they say like, okay, well, they're into chickens, but they don't eat them, and they don't even want to eat their eggs. So you see, and, and, and especially in greater Amazonia, this is where the, there's some difference between the culture regions, but the idea of eating an animal who you fed, which is the essence of livestock husbandry, is repugnant, you know, so. So we have a question from online. Can you talk about any other examples of indigenous Americans relating to European introduced animals in ways that caused Europeans to consider those animals differently? Well, that, that's a great question. Actually, one, one example comes from um, Vene what is today Venezuela, um, where a Spanish chronicler is, or actually a Spanish soldier, is describing how um, some people in that area are reacting to horses. And remember, the Spanish are very impressed with their horses. They have a huge amount of, of respect for horses and what they're capable of, and in fact, you know, credit horses for their ability to colonize. And he can't believe how this man is talking to a horse. And, you know, and, and he says, like, he's treating him like a person. So even someone who already, a European who already has such a, um, you, know, you know, respect for horses still finds something different Another, actually, example that I love um, 
has to do with dogs. And so, and, and so one of the introduced species in Amazonia um, is the use of, of hunting dogs. And they become really, in a lot of areas, really um, you know, keenly interested in using dogs in that European way. But they, the tenderness with which these dogs are treated is, is pretty shocking to them. You know, there's a, just in the hilarious, this is in chapter um, 10, if you want to <laughs> get there, where, where um, a Spaniard says, you know, the dog, you know, licks himself and he farts and he like, scratches and they just find it so cute. <laughs> Which like, you know, for those of us who have dogs, like you can relate that. And, and for them, that was like, no, this, this, these, that's not how you're supposed to use a dog. So. Thank you so much for this talk and for the book. And I have a question that's a little bit inchoate because what this is all reminding me of is how much our assumptions about the quote unquote progress of civilization depends on models that were very much developed by European colonizers in the 19th century and previously where we see these stages of development being associated with these longstanding assumptions and that those things are still being used as a way of thinking about different, you know, quote unquote, primitive societies. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the way in which your book forces us to think differently, not just about human animal relationships, but our entire vision of what it means to become um, more advanced and also the kind of anxiety that it speaks to about Europeans finding that there are other ways of being that may be challenging to theirs. So if you could talk a little yeah. bit more about that, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Catherine. And, um, and thank Catherine helped me with a particular passage in the book, so thank you for that too. Um, so yeah, I mean, th that is a, a really central argument of this book, that the sort of blindness that both contemporary observers have and modern scholars have had to these practices has everything to do with a kind of evolutionary uh, model of civilization that itself was really important, as I, I'll just reiterate this, to the colonizers in, in justifying what they did. The, the notion that there are, there's such a thing as a more primitive society and more advanced society, and domesticate, animal domestication is often um, you know, offered as one of those. And I think this, is, it, this idea is getting increasingly criticized. I'm not the only one. David Graeber's, you know, Dawn of the Dawn of Everything um, talks about this as well. Um, but I think because domestication is, is so central to these narratives, um, I, I think it deserves particular emphasis. Um, and, and you see this too in, in agriculture as well. I mean, we're, we're discovering, I mean, not like people in the West are seeing now that areas that um, had, you know, extensive, like what we used to be called like this idea you go from foraging to agriculture is domesticated crops is, is, is more advanced as, you know, to put it like enlightenment terms, you know, sort of, um, you know, greater civilization. In fact, the knowledge that have to go, goes with being able to use wild plants, you know, is just incredible. You know, argue, argue, you could argue that there's like a de-skilling even when you have domestication of both plants and animals. Um, and yeah, and, and that the part of where I go with this as well, I think there's oftentimes, I mean, and I'm, let me say this, I'm a huge admirer of what scientists teach us about animals and other things. But there is sometimes this kind of, um, it's like, well, there's the whole language around discovery. Like, aha, we discovered, you know, I mean, very recently, in fact, in Nature, there was a, an article discovering that livestock are smart, you know, and, um, and that pigs and, you know, cows have complex abilities of 
of you know reasoning. But I think we need to inverse it. It's not so much discovering, but ask the question. You know, in some ways, you can say this is what I'm asking. Why did we forget? You know, what is it in European culture that made these things unseeable, invisible? And I think this is our last question. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to say, you know, what a what a beautiful talk and um, how fascinating it has been to listen to you um, and to hear about your research. The, the question I have has to do with um, with the work uh, the work of research when working with these uh, um, archives of what I'm going to call, you know, compromised materials in a way, materials that, that so clearly reflect the coloniality and of course the colonial colonial knowledge systems were so dependent upon indigenous ways of knowing and, and your your talk has shown so clearly that that's the case and for those of us as early modern scholars working with these materials um, is there something that you would offer us um, as a scholar yourself I mean I'm hearing words like tenderness um, and, you know, clearly you've, you've worked with a tremendous amount of sensitivity to, um, in order to pick up beyond what um, those texts might think that they are saying, in, in, in a sense, I, I guess. I mean, I, I'm also hearing in, the, in your answer to the last question that, that in fact there's a kind of a, a self-critical or at least critique of those very knowledge systems, those colonial knowledge systems that, um, you know, impose dominance in the way that they do. So I, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to advise the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it's, it is, I mean, everything you say is true. I mean, absolutely, these are colonial sources. I mean, I, there are, I mean, I, I did, in the Mesoamerica, I did work with, um, you know, the very small archive of of these screenful tonalama, as they're known in, in, um, in Nahuatl. Um, but by and large, my source base are the products of colonialism. And what I find is that, you know, interspersed among that this, like, for instance, the ideology of, of European progress, they, they reveal so much, you know, and it is, it is often in the uh, effective, you know, responses, like as, as with the case of animals, where in you know, someone like Hernandez will go from, you know, ad admonishing um, the indigenous communities who he was so dependent upon for their childish beliefs or the superstitions, and then in the next sentence, show this palpable pleasure at his experiences with these animals that were tamed. And I guess it's maybe looking for those moments of, of kind of, of contradiction and effective response and not going over them quickly, but like just slowing down and, and zeroing in on them. And then taking all these little pieces together. You know, I mean, it's sort of, a, I guess, a kind of collage I mean, I would say that's the other part is sort of a collage-like method where because of the nature of the questions that I'm asking, there's not going to be a source that sort of provides a full answer, but taking each of the little pieces of the puzzle and, and trying to piece, re-piece them together in ways that were not at all intended by those who produced them. So I think we will end here. Thank you.